My name's Maria Anderson, and yes, I have a sugar problem. My life in food has been filled with inconsistencies and a lot of sugar. I'd like to have you come along with me through the struggle that I faced and um, the journey that hopefully I'm making toward wellness for community as well as for myself. I was adopted as an infant, so I started my food life with baby formula rather than with breast milk, which was fine, except that the milk formulas made me violently ill. So much that I think my parents must have considered sending me back to the baby store where they got me, um, but thankfully they didn't. So they switched me over to soy formula. I became a de facto vegan by the time I was three months of age, and I wish I could say that we all ate happily ever after, um, but there's a little more to it than that. I was kept off milk through childhood, and honestly, the lack of ice cream and pizza and chocolate was psychologically traumatizing. I remember a time when my mom swooped into a birthday party that I was at as a kid and took from my hands this piece of chocolate cake I was about to eat right at the last second, and I still kind of have to go through therapy to work through that. <laughs> but what I lacked in dairy, I more than made up for in sugar. I would eat those packets of colored sugar that came with a sugar stick. Do you know what I'm talking about? You sort of dip the stick in the sugar. And then I would also eat the sugar straws where you just poured it straight into your mouth. I would suck the juice out of a lemon with a candy, a candy stick, like a lemon flavored candy stick to suck the, the sugar out of there. One by one, my teeth eroded with cavities. I grew up in southern New Jersey, which meant having amazing fresh tomatoes. I'm like, there we go. Having amazing fresh tomatoes and corn and peaches from down the street. But unfortunately, growing up, we were just as likely to have canned and soggy spinach and green beans and asparagus. Um, my life with Vegetables was kind of a complicated relationship. During childhood, I failed to form a food value system. And what I mean by that is I never learned to distinguish what activist and author Michael Pollan would call food-like substances, you know, where there's calories but little nutritional value, from true whole food. The problem only got worse in adolescence. I started eating pizza, even though it made me violently ill. I was taught by my dad, mostly, about the deliciousness of the burnt fat that's on the edge of the steak. Have you ever eaten that? <laughs> the joy of a huge slice of pie with a big scoop of Cool Whip, and in the magic of the Twinkie snack cake. I ate a Twinkie every single day in high school for my lunch snack. I have a friend, in fact, who made a game out of finding my Twinkie and then smashing it with her fist, and I didn't care. I would open up the plastic, and I loved the sound of the plastic, and I'd scoop out the cake and the sugar and just kind of eat it with my hand. And then I would go home, and I'd have one or two or a box full of Twinkies as an after-school snack. There were plenty of opportunities for growth and insight during that time. At one point, a girl told me I was too hippie, but I kind of misunderstood her and thought she meant that I was a hippie, which I thought was reasonably cool, and I didn't see any problem with that. So the comment just kind of washed past me. But when my father had a major heart attack in his 40s, that abruptly changed the landscape of food in my house. My mother followed to the letter the advice of the dietician who was at my dad's bedside. No more would there be pork chops fried in butter or pizza every Saturday night from the mob-run pizza joint down the street. With the changes that my mom made, my dad lost 20 or 30 pounds. And I obviously became sensitive to the fact that I could lose my dad over something that was caused by food. Interestingly, though, my mom changed our diet, but not her own. She would make us, say, broiled fish, and then she'd cook herself a cheeseburger with french fries. <laughs> so there were a lot of mixed messages in my household. Forming a food value system requires cooking. 
My mom cooked at home and was an excellent baker, but she had a lot of rules about how things were supposed to go in her kitchen. If I wanted to help her or learn to cook, I had to do these sort of ritualistic behaviors, like I would have to sort through the already very highly processed rice to see if there were little rice bugs, rice weevils. I never found one, but I guess they exist. And also, I would always have to inspect the cans to see if there was evidence of botulism, which I also never found in the 1970s. So I quickly lost interest in the kitchen. But thankfully, a woman who was like a second mother to me soon showed me that cooking could be a joy, that it could be natural, that looking for the best ingredients could be a pleasure that was richly rewarded. So I started to cook at that point, and I was guided by her principles, which included never too much garlic, which I still follow today, but also everything's better with a little more butter. In college, I gained cultural awareness, and that led to some social activism and community service. But along with that cultural awareness came a suspicion of the man. And so I, what I mean by the man is, you know, the man's not going to tell me what I can look like or what I can eat or how much I should weigh. The man was shorthand for society, for culture, for magazines that equated female beauty with anorexia. In college, I ate nachos and sausages from carts at midnight, and I drank beer. I gained the obligatory 15 pounds, and my cholesterol was high, and that was when I was a teenager. Now I see that as a misdirected kind of rebelliousness, but at the time, the man was a great excuse to eat whatever I wanted. Soon I attended medical school, where I learned shockingly little about nutrition. But I was exposed to the scale of disease caused by what we put in our mouths. I learned that most amputees suffered not from trauma, but from obesity-related diabetes. I learned that most people who were on hemodialysis were there due to chronic overeating, leading to hypertension and obesity and then kidney failure. I learned that the leading cause of blindness among adults in our country wasn't some mysterious or romantic seeming infection like Mary Ingalls had on Little House on the Prairie. Um, but again, obesity related diabetes. This dramatically widened my perspective on eating and wellness. But even so, I still lacked a deep personal understanding of the profound interconnection between food and health. A residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in cardiology followed. And during those seven years, I met a lot of people who could no longer fit on a 300 or 350 or 400 pound limited exam table. I took care of a man who hid bags of candy in his hospital bedside, even while he was dying of obesity related heart failure and lung restriction. More people started to come to their appointments in scooters because their knees had given out under the excess weight. I cared for a prisoner as he completed a sentence for murder. And after 20 years in the hospital, he got out, I mean, in the, in the prison, he got out and went straight to Chinese food and wound up in the hospital within a day due to congestive heart failure precipitated by salt. One woman I took care of couldn't stop eating her ice cream as her intensive care unit physician explained that she was very likely to die of complications from obesity. And I took care of an 18-year-old girl with a heart attack, not from some weird childhood heart abnormality, but from two-pack-a-day smoking and high cholesterol. I was starting to see more of diseases of the old in people who were young. So what was I eating during those years? I lived near farms, and I took advantage of local fresh produce, and I learned the terms local and seasonal. But on the other hand, drug companies who made drugs for high cholesterol and high blood pressure, um, maybe they're another manifestation of the man, um, they brought us lunches of burritos and lasagna and cookies and brownies. The residency can be exhausting and stressful. When you're a resident, you learn Never stand when you can sit. Never sit when you can lie down. See a donut, eat a donut. See a burrito, eat a burrito. My own doctor warned me then that my weight was steadily increasing and that my triglycerides, which are a measure of fat in your bloodstream, were high. 
I became pregnant with a six pound baby and gained 45 pounds. All of my experience and knowledge were still not enough to keep me from falling into obesity and the health problems that related from it. I was great at living with contradictions. After I had my daughter, concern for what I was putting in her mouth led me to care more for what I was putting in my own. But around that time, even more importantly, I gained friends who were passionate about food issues. I cooked more. Uh, I read Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma. I learned about community-sponsored agriculture I bought from farmer's markets. I started to understand, really, how my health correlated with my food. I lost the 45 pounds and 10 more. I moved to Colorado after training and became a shareholder at uh, Delaney Farm, which is a CSA within Denver Urban Gardens. And that helped me overcome a lifelong black thumb and learn about organic farming. Being surrounded by people who are passionate about hunger and obesity was transformative for me. These people provided cohesion to a lifetime of these individual experiences I had. Their work in bringing great food to the community was inspiring. I dropped a few more pounds and got my triglycerides finally to low normal, and I had much more energy and just felt better. I also, around that time, joined a journal club where physicians talk about articles uh, relating to preventing heart disease. Most of the discussions we had centered on cholesterol-lowering statin medications, the perfect blood pressure pill for every scenario, and the best use of stress testing or calcium scoring. But what we didn't seem to discuss was the obesity epidemic and how to counter that. My colleagues sort of had a sense of fatalism about trying to teach people about lifestyle rather than prescribe them a medication. Even though they themselves generally followed a very healthy way of life, they had a hard time kind of conveying that to people. And hearing that, I started to feel the weight of all the food contradictions that I'd been under for all those years. We always meet over dinner, and suddenly fried calamari and tiramisu didn't seem as appealing as they might otherwise. So by default, I became the devil's advocate and started to, to discuss prevention from a lifestyle standpoint. I brought articles about the effects of sugar-sweetened beverages on high blood pressure and obesity. I was able to present to them the work of TED Prize winner Jamie Oliver and his work in transforming school lunch programs. And I talked to them about repeat TED speaker Dr. Dean Ornish, um, who's not only defined what it is to have a healthy lifestyle, lifestyle but has shown that healthy lifestyle can reverse heart disease. So in that small way, I helped my colleagues kind of have the courage to pass on specific lifestyle advice to their many patients. And from a personal standpoint, having the opportunity to teach others about those kinds of lifestyle changes really focused my attention on my own. In my first job as a cardiologist in Colorado, I saw a lot of obesity-related illness. But it was very difficult to treat the underlying obesity Appointments were short, and I was informed that taking the time to counsel people about their weight um, wasn't reimbursable. In other words, insurance company would pay doctors to place stents in heart arteries and prescribe medications and perform lots of stress tests, but not to reduce the need for those things or to offer a better therapy. Stents don't prevent heart attacks, but a healthy lifestyle does. I left that first job without a clear indication of what I was going to do next. <clears throat> After about two days of enjoying not working, I started a business. It was called Medical Mentors, and it was a private medical practice that was focused on lifestyle change and health improvement. It was an amazing experience, and I finally had the time to teach people about lifestyle change and get into their homes. Sadly, around that time, the economy suffered, and my practice closed. And even though it was a failure from a business standpoint, I learned a lot about starting a business, about PR and marketing, about forming a website. Also, I gained just these entrepreneurial skills. And after that, I was able to form uh, my own job 
uh, with a great cardiology practice that allowed for a flexible schedule. Then I learned through the Women as Social Entrepreneurs community of Cooking Matters, which is a national organization which does almost exactly what my business did. So now I work as a nutrition educator for them, and I have the time, 12 hours over six weeks, to spend teaching people about durable lifestyle change. In my life, there have been experiences and education and exposure to the world. And then there was community. community allows cohesion to all these random experiences we have and helps internally contradictory individuals to make sense of everything through their own journeys. It will take a community of food activists and teachers and educators and TED speakers and TED attendees to turn around the obesity epidemic. I'm honored to be a part of that community. I feel like I'm very early in my own food activist journey but I hope that my gradual de development mirrors that of the global food movement toward healthier eating, which is becoming more cohesive and determined and active every day. And I hope that my personal evolution supports and elevates your own. Thank you.